Affairs Committee to order and welcome everybody to the committee today and thank uh, Secretary Wilkie, Wilkie in particular and all the members of the the staff for being here today. You're going to get a lot of questions, I know, and hopefully give us a lot of good answers and then we'll hopefully get some good results at the end of the year and be moving in the right direction. But we had a, the committee and the VA had a good year to get last year. We got a lot of things squared away that hadn't been, hadn't been needed to be addressed for some time. We got some laws passed y'all wanted for some time, said you needed for some time, and we, we want to, we gave them to you and we're going to look for the results this year. And that's what we're going to be reviewing is making sure we're making progress with results, not just promises. And, and I, I think we will be able to do that. This is an important meeting today. This is our annual review of the budget. The President's budget came out a few days ago. The VA's budget is a, is a significant one and significantly increased. We have a unique situation. We get more money than anybody in increases every year. As a percentage, however you want to calculate it, money is not our problem. Now, I know there's some people in this room say, oh, yes, it is. I need this much more. I could do this. But we, we've been, we, we've looked out for our vets, veterans. We know we're paying for benefits they've earned, and we know we got to finance them. And I'm proud the President's budget is up 9.1, is that right? 9.5, and $220 billion, correct? And that's a, that's a huge budget. But what I want to do this morning in my open remarks, really just focus a little bit on this year and then how we did, came to where we are. First thing I want to do is thank the VSOs. I changed the way we do this meeting. Used to, they came in with a second panel. First panel was the secretary. Second panel was all the VSOs. That took a lot of time. It diminished the value of each person's testimony. And we've just finished with meetings with all the VSOs, almost all, with all the VSOs over the last five weeks anyway. So the important thing I asked the VSOs to do was to submit their testimony in writing and submit the questions they want specifically to have answered in writing, and then we get those. And they, su they submitted some terrific questions and prompted great thought on, on my part and other members' part as we went over those and reviewed those questions. And they'll be sent for answers to the Secretary. And Mr. Secretary, I'm going to expect an answer on all of them. And uh, I want to thank the VAs for the time, v VSOs for the time they put into it. And make sure you know that just because I didn't include you in terms of verbal testimony at this meeting, it's not because we didn't want to hear from you. I want to see that what we heard from you actually got done. So I ask you to submit it in writing, and we'll submit that to the VA, and then we'll follow up on it rather than have it lost somewhere in the ethos system once you've said it here and it's gone wherever it goes. The second thing I want to do today is talk about two meetings we, we have coming up that I'm going to insist. I promise members, I try and keep my promises. I've, I've, we've done amazingly well on that, uh, and it's because we had cooperation by all the committee, particularly the ranking member. But number one, uh, Senator Manchin had asked for a, uh, a discussion on burn pits and toxic exposure, et cetera. We're going to have a meeting on toxic exposure. It will come later in the year after we have begun to swallow the uh, Blue Water Navy. My understanding is that, uh, that is this, it's true, Mr. Secretary Wilkie, that the Blue Water Navy Deci league court decision is not being uh, challenged. Is that right? Uh, that would be my recommendation from VA. Yeah, and I, VA has recommended that, which I appreciate, and I have, I have offered that opinion as well, and I think that's what's going to end up happening. And if that happens, we're going to be in the process of beginning to swallow a big uh, bite and chew it and dissolve it and get it. I was happy to learn from the Secretary that 51 people have already been treated uh, that would have been eligible for that. That benefit, Blue Water Navy benefit, anyway. Is that, is that correct? 51,000. 51,000. And uh, I please appreciate the Secretary and the VA doing such a good, thorough job as far as Blue Water Navy is concerned in, in anticipation of what this committee and the other committee in the House did on Blue Water Navy. So hopefully that will continue. The other is uh, access standards. And the big fellow sitting to my right has made it clear to me that access standards are a big thing with him. Well, they're a big thing with me, too. Because if you really think about it, if, if the, if the recently published for comment uh, rules uh, and standards for access of community care. Once those are finished, then, then in Alaska and in uh, Kansas and North Dakota, South Dakota, Georgia, Montana, everywhere, our more rural veterans in more rural areas, how it's working for them to get them the care they need as quickly as we can, get a system that works so doctors want to be a part of it, Get our third party administrator working to make sure that they've got a good repertoire of doctors available to be chosen from to meet the standards. 
it's just terrific. So I'm going to focus on access standards at our next uh, meeting, which we have in April the 10th. Is that right? And uh, we're going to focus on access standards. I'm going to encourage everybody to be there, because if we do one thing this year, if we can get that working. That's the part of choice that was hard. That's the part of choice that had the most problems. And we can get it working right for the VA and the veteran and right for us, then we're going to have taken care of our single biggest problem in terms of operations out there on a daily basis in terms of veterans' benefits. So with that said, uh, I'll end my opening remark and turn to, I guess I should, have I welcomed the secretary yet? I'm going to I'll let you have your opening remark, then I'll welcome the secretary. John Good Tester. Well, thank you. Thank you much, Mr. Chairman. I don't want to beat you the punch, but I want to welcome Secretary Wilkie and Dr. Lawrence and Dr. Stone and I think you just did. Mr. Rachowski to the hearing today. I, I look forward to uh, learning from you today, and, and I want to thank your team and thank you for what you guys do every day. Um, the chairman talked about access standards, and, and access standards will be talked about a lot today. We've talked about privatization. Uh, nobody around this table, and I don't believe any of you want to see that happen. But it's something I'm very concerned about because the big boss talks about it all the time. And uh, uh, in the end, we need to make sure that, as the, v as the VSOs told us a couple weeks ago during Joint House and Veterans Affairs Committee, they prefer the care that you guys provide. That's, that's a good thing, okay? I think that's a very good thing. That means you guys are, are doing some things right, okay? And we'll talk about a few things you might not be doing so right today. And uh, I'll apologize ahead of time, but the truth is is that these are folks that have served our country, and we need to make sure we live up the promises, uh, as you well know, Mr. Secretary, the promises we made to them. Um, look, over the past few years, this committee's heard uh, from the VA about what it needs to be successful. We've engaged with the VSOs, as we did for the last couple of weeks, to see what they wanted in their VA. And I will tell you, this committee listened, and we acted, uh, leading the way on a number of monumental reforms that, quite frankly, a lot of people didn't think we could ever get done, but we did last Congress on behalf of our nation's veterans. This is an important part of our job, providing you, the VA, with the tools that you need to do your job. Yeah. Equally critically, though, uh, is your job is deciding how the new authorities and the resources are executed and utilized. And that is where, as I've said already, my concern tend to lie. In my view, the level of commitment from Congress to address health care vacancies and critical infrastructure needs at the VA uh, needs to be matched by the department. Uh, I've talked about my parochial interest in Montana, and I'm going to talk about it again today, Fort Harrison. Uh, by the way, if you run back about 15 years, it was one of the top VA facilities in the country. Fort Harrison today has one primary care physician, a part-time doctor who sees a handful of patients. I've got CBOX in Montana, as, as you know, Mr. Secretary, with no primary care doctors, no advanced primary care clinicians, and where that care is only provided through telehealth. Now, I'm going to tell you, telehealth's a great innovation, and it does some great things with folks that have mental health issues, but it cannot replace all types of health care. So you get the frustration that VA primary focus seems to be expanding eligibility and investments into community care. And I don't want it to be at the expense of capacity building initiatives. I'm going to say that again. I don't want our investments in community care to be at the expense of capacity building initiatives. As you and I have discussed, there's certainly a role for the private sector, especially in a rural state like Montana. I'm sure Se Senator Sullivan would agree in Alaska and other states too. But I think <clears throat> we've got to be careful that we don't take the department down a dangerous path uh, when it comes to veterans, uh, you can outsource the care, but you can't outsource the responsibility. And when they're sent into the community care, uh, without first knowing if that care can be provided in a timely manner, and if it's quality care, um, we're going to pay the price for that later. Because quite frankly, the, v the v veteran's going to come back and say why. So I think we need to hold our VA providers to one set of standards and community care, care providers to that same set of standards. After all, none of us want a flood of veterans going to community care if it has lower and less, a lower quality and less timely. And we certainly can't head down a path without a firm grasp on how much it's going to cost the American taxpayer. Uh, for example, we received multiple esti estimates from the department on how much it would cost to implement access standards in the month leading up to the budget request. None of those estimates match the number that finally appeared in the budget request. And as we go forth, I'd like you to clarify that if you could, why that is. So it's not clear 
how that estimate came about. Uh, it's also not clear whether the technology you need to implement this program, such as a decision support tool, will be ready in time for implementation. I've been receiving conflicting reports about the readiness of this tool. Uh, I'm frustrated we continue to hear about IT solutions that may not be executed properly. There's a huge chunk of money in this budget for IT. If it's not spent properly, we've wasted taxpayer dollars and we haven't delivered the services to our veterans that they've earned. Uh, as you know, the VA has struggled for many years in the field of IT, earning it a place on the GAO's high-risk list uh, this year again. Uh, I recently had a great meeting with Jim Graffer, uh, but there is no OIT representation from the department here today. Um, and so I hope that's not a reflection of how this issue is being prioritized. Uh, I know the table's short, so you have to pick and choose. Uh, but we have seen how flawed IT rollouts impact veterans and the progress the VA is making on replacing an antiquated system that can't afford to be plagued with shortcuts. By the way, we are here today with the mission program as a direct result of IT failures in Arizona. So this is a big thing. We need to, we need to, uh, we need to work. You, you've got a great team around you, Mr. Secretary. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I think you're a great guy. I think you're the right guy for this job, and I'm glad you're there. But we need to find out the details of this budget. And as we move forward, I certainly do not want to see VA care dollars transferred to community care because we ran out of money in the community care budget. So with that, I would just say thank you all for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to, uh, to speak, and I look forward to this hearing. Thank you, Senator Tester, for everybody's benefit here. I think I heard, without exception, at our hearings with the VSOs, we ain't gonna privatize, said 100 times. I didn't have a single person write me, call me, trip me up, throw me down the steps or anything else wanting to privatize the VA, and I have no interest in doing so. So let's just put that sign behind the bathroom door rather than the front door. Let's talk about making the VA the best VA we can make it and be what our veterans want it to be, which John's right, they like their VA. And that's why they call it my VA. They just want it to be a little bit better, and that's what we want to make it a little bit better, better in its accountability and better in its results, and that's what we'll be talking about. With that said, talking about better, we have the best guy you could ever have in terms of Secretary of the VA. Robert Wilkie's, I did not know uh, Mr. Wilkie until he was appointed, I guess. That's the first time we met. I learned quite frequently he's got a good bedside manner. He's really easy to talk to. He just uh, has a resonant voice. He's very easy going, knows some great jokes that are all clean. He's just a, <laughs> just a terrific guy all the way around. But the good thing about it is he doesn't, he doesn't just have a good personality and, and a good demeanor. He, he likes to get the job done. And he talks in measures that are accountable, hold, that hold himself count, accountable, and I appreciate that. And I think with his type of persona, we already are seeing improvements and results with the VA. We've got a long way to go. They do a lot of things well, and we're proud of those things. We want to get, do the things we don't do well better and take some of our problems that have been hanging on with us for a long time and, do, and, and get those problems solved. And I think Robert Wilkie's the man to do it, and I'm really pleased we, to work with him and John Tester and the members of our committee in the Senate to see to it we finish the job. We'll never finish the job, but continue the job of improving the Veterans Administration for the benefit of our vets. With that said, I could go over your military background, your fact that you're a good Southern boy, and all those good things, Robert. But instead, I'd like to say we have a great Secretary of the Veterans Administration. I'm proud to work with Robert Wilkie. appreciate what he does, and I'm proud to introduce him for as much time as he might consume, except remind him that how much he does consume may consider how much we enjoy what he has to say. So don't take too much of it. <laughs> well, well, well Let's introduce your other. Yes, sir. Here. Well, th first of all, thank you for the courtesy and thank you for the kindness that you've you've shown me. Um, I, I'm going to take a point of personal privilege and and thank you and Senator Tester for all the support that you've given me. Um, as you know, I came to this uh, have, having been the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. Uh, I was raised in the in the military world. Uh, my service compared to my ancestors is incredibly modest, um, but it is service nonetheless, and I have been privileged to see the military life from, from many angles. Uh, so there is no higher honor than to be sitting here uh, before you. Uh, I am pleased to have with me, and I'll start uh, on the left side, uh, John Wachowski, who is our uh, budget guru, uh, our assistant secretary for management, and our chief financial officer. Uh, Dr. Richard Stone, who is our executive in charge of VHA, and uh, our most recent award winner, who's just received an award for being the government, government's best senior executive, 
and that is Dr. Paul Lawrence, our Undersecretary for Benefits, and I thank them for coming. Um, when I last reported to this committee, uh, Mr. Chairman, in December, uh, I said that the state of VA is better. Uh, I believe from the statements that you've made and from the statements Senator Tester's made that you believe that as well. Uh, I count that to the support of this committee. Uh, earlier this morning, I addressed the, the um, House Doctors Caucus, and I said the changes made in VA were not driven by the executive branch. The changes made in the VA came from the two authorizing committees. Uh, I argue that it is the most transformative period in the history of this department going all the way back to Omar Bradley's day. Um, and uh, I don't believe that we are any longer on the cusp of transformation. We are actually in the middle of it. Um, but, but before I talk about that, I do want to talk about the trajectory that VA is on. In the last month we've had, uh, last few months, we've had some excellent news. Uh, in most of my career in and out of government, VA has always been rated 16 of 17 or 17 out of 17 in terms of the best places in government to work. Well, the Partnership for Public Service for the first time said we're no longer there. We're in the top third and we're actually moving in a higher direction. So if we have customer service amongst ourselves, we will provide good customer service to those that we are honored to serve. Uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine said, as Senator Tester implied, that the medical care that VA gives is good or better than any medical care in any region of the country. We're proud of that. And last, the Journal of the American Medical Association said that our wait times in the four most important categories of medical care are as good or better than any in the private sector. Uh, that is an indication as to where we are headed in our department. The major driver of transformation is the, the Mission Act. As you know, it simplifies and consolidates VA's seven community care programs into a single streamlined, simple to use program. It extends the choice program, expands the caregiver program, and provides a new urgent care benefit as well as other access improvements. Regulations setting new access standards ensuring greater choice for veterans will be completed in June. We have proposed a 30-minute average drive time standard for primary care and mental health care and a 60-minute average drive time standard for specialty care. We have also proposed an appointment wait time standards of 20 days for primary care and mental health care and 28 days for specialty care from the date of request with certain exceptions. And I, I want to also begin to address the privatization argument. Uh, obviously, I come from the conservative Republican side of the aisle. Um, the issue that, that has been raised many times about privatization is just not borne out by our budget, by the directions of this committee. And I am here to say, as Senator Tester said, that the care in the private sector, nine times out of ten, is probably not as good as care in VA. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of your colleagues um, gave an interview in a in one of his state's newspapers saying that he was disappointed in the, the wait times um, for certain services at VA in one of his major metropolitan areas. Uh, the wait time was 12 days for VA. In the major metropolitan area, it was 78 days. So that also is an indication that we are moving in the direction that you have pointed to, pointed for us and the direction that veterans deserve. Things are not always greener on the other side of the hill. Um, at the same time, we are trying uh, to move out and making VA a modern 21st century healthcare administration. Uh, no longer will we have an ad hoc supply chain. We are tying in with the Department of Defense and their computerized systems for medical supplies. The days where VA doctors at the DCVA have to run across the parking lot to MedStar to find equipment have to be over if we are going to continue the road of improvement. The other part of our major transformation is the electronic health record, where we tie in with the DOD, DOD the minute that young American walks into the military entrance processing station so that we have a complete picture of that veteran's health. The chairman mentioned burn pits. For the first time, when this 
is online, VA doctors will be able to see everything that had happened in that soldier's life, from exposures to, to toxics overseas, from exposures to toxics in the continental United States, and we will then know better how to um, serve that veteran. Uh, I have been asked to lead the National Suicide Prevention Task Force. That is one of three areas that VA is moving out on in response to this committee. For Senator Manchin, it's the opioid epidemic and how we begin to change the way we treat our veterans when it comes to the use of opioids. Homelessness is another area. And then finally, suicide prevention. Uh, in the last uh, year, we have hired over 3,900 mental health professionals. We now provide same-day mental health service for veterans in need. Uh, as part of the continued transformation, uh, we are also engaging in the creation of a modern HR system. Right now, there are 140 HR offices across VA. We are consolidating those down to 18. And for the first time, bringing in HR professionals to create a modern, modern human resource capability that will send doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals to those parts of the country's, country where they are most needed. As for the budget, um, the chairman is right. $220 billion budget. That's a 9.5% increase over what VA had last year. That's $97 billion in discretionary spending, a $123.2 billion in mandatory spending, and funding for 393 full-time employees, which is an increase in 13,000 for uh, those working at VA. That means that for the Mission Act, 19% of the funding will go to community care, but 81% for VA care. 1.6 billion to uh, the electronic health record, 184 million for a modern integrated financial acquisition management system and 36 million for us to continue to adopt the Defense Medical Logistics Standard Support System. 8.1 million to continue the improvement in customer service, the prime directive for those in VA, 547 million for women's health, and $1.6 billion for capital investment. Um, the last item on my list is uh, to continue uh, my pledge to you that we be an open department. We are joined at the hip with this committee and with the, the committees of the House of Representatives. We all have the same mission in mind. And again, I thank you for your, your courtesy. I thank you for allowing me the honor of serving in this capacity, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you much, very much, Mr. Secretary. We appreciate it. I Appreciate your acknowledgement of what I had said earlier about the amount of money we were talking about. We're not here complaining about what we have to spend it on. We're looking for answers to spend it better and see our veterans get better services and we work out better all along. But we've got a good budget to work with. We're not begging for more. We're looking for results. And which brings me to my first question that I'll ask. The private sector today in healthcare, the whole answer to most, the, whatever the question is, the answer is outcomes. They're measure, trying to measure outcomes for everything from reimbursement to being in networks to anything else. Are you, when you refer to the improvements that you've referred to, how do you measure your outcomes in the VA? Do you take them from uh, the senior person in charge or do you take them from evaluations or do you take them randomly? How, how do you gauge your outcomes for the services you provide to our veterans? A combination, Mr. Chairman. I, I really look to the veterans first. Uh, I have been very aggressive in the eight months that I've been in this chair in reaching out to veterans in terms of surveys, in terms of, of interviews. Uh, what I've seen is that our customer satisfaction rates are, are moving in uh, an upward direction uh, where we have, I think, an 89% customer satisfaction rate amongst veterans. Uh, in terms of other metrics, opioids is the outstanding example. How are we changing the way that we approach this national tragedy. And we, we approach it in changing the way that we treat our veterans by providing things that would have been anathema to somebody like my father 30 or 40 years ago with alternative medicines, uh, Tai Chi, 
uh, acupuncture, uh, yoga. Um, we are on the cutting edge both of, of alternative treatments to our veterans, we are on the cutting edge of telehealth, as Se Senator Tester said, and we are on the cutting edge in terms of, of tackling uh, the national epidemic of suicide and homelessness. So the answer is, it's a combination of things, but for me, the most important is listening to what our veterans say. On that answer, let me say this. Is in, your, um, in the budget, uh, in the recommendations you have, it includes funding for retiring two IT systems that currently exist within the VA. You and I have talked this, about this before, but it seems like to me the VA is a place where you collect software and systems and where people have bought things over the years, they've piled up, they don't talk to each other, they don't work together, and, and we're not getting good bang for our buck. You obviously are trying to clean that up, and I would like for you to talk about those two recommendations in terms of retiring those programs and the overall picture in terms of VA's IT system and getting it improved and getting it better. Well, um, I told you eight months ago that the overall condition of VA's IT system was bad. Um, as a result of that, uh, this committee uh, is looking at, as Senator Tester said, a massive increase in our budget, uh, $4.2 billion, I believe. But uh, that money in the past has been spent on redundant systems, um, going down the same road that led to the failure in the Forever GI Bill, uh, as well as other systems. So what we are doing, um, and you, will, I believe, will have the CIO up here for testimony in the next few weeks, is we are beginning to migrate our legacy systems out and bring the VA in line with the rest of America through the, through the cloud. Uh, we now have uh, 8,000 employees who are dedicated simply to that transition. Um, we will ask uh, for a bit of patience on some of these, um, but the migration to the cloud um, is the wave of the future. And it is the way that we will maintain, I think, the trajectory that VA has, has undergone in terms of its overall customer service. Uh, but you are absolutely right. Um, the reason the forever GI Bill crashed and burned and that um, the directions from this committee were placed on a 40-year-old IT system, it was bound to fail. Uh, which is one of the reasons why I stopped us going down that same old road and, and pivoted just so we can make sure that our veterans got their checks. Well, let me say one thing. I'm not going to ask another question, but I'll make a statement. And I'll, I'll make an admission, too. The state of Georgia brought me in when they lost their superintendent of schools in the middle of an election cycle to take over the Board of Education in Georgia and the Department of Education going through Y2K. Now, I had a pretty good company in terms of dealing with technology and stuff like that. And I'd learned that you buy every, you can buy every trick in the book when the salespeople come in and start talking to you. They got an advantage. They know what they're talking about. You don't know. And you don't understand. If you're as old as I am, you don't really understand digits and clouds and all the other types. I want to find that damn cloud one of these days, too. I want to see where that thing is. Everybody always says it's the solution. Well, I think it may be the problem. I just can't find it anywhere. But anyway, my, my point is this. So many times when we go to clean up a system of technology information, we end up buying more stuff to clean up the mess, and we have a bigger mess when it's over than we had before, and we haven't solved the main problem, which is the workability and the interoperability of the IT systems we had. So let me just encourage you to make sure we got the right people who know what they're talking about, making the decisions or the recommendations to you in the final decision, that understand technology and what it can and cannot do, and don't buy every bit and promise that comes through the front door, because that gets expensive and can cause you lots of problems. And if we've got such a, the VA is so big, the number of employees is so large, the budget is so big, you're talking about any little problem in the VA is a big cost, particularly if it's the IT system. So I, I encourage you to, what you're doing, I appreciate what you're doing on that. Mr. Tester. I'm sorry? I'll yield to Joe Manch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and Secretary, thank you for being here. And. Uh, I, don't, I haven't met a, a veteran yet in my state, and you know, we have a high percentage of veterans who want the VA to be privatized. And I, I haven't heard that from any of you all, and I don't think you do either. But here's the, the troubling thing that we have. Your request is 44% decrease in funding levels for construction programs. That was in the budget that you, that you all submitted. 
I know that uh, we are investing heavily in community care. We're leaving our current VA facilities. Let me give you a few examples. Um, in, our, uh, in, in rural states such as mine in West Virginia, our rural mobile unit in Clarksburg is totally inoperable, totally inoperable. Uh, our, VA, uh, our medical centers haven't had any update and great increase uh, or increase in residential rehab centers since the 50s and 60s. Uh, most of our facilities require basic maintenance, uh, deferred maintenance as we call for roofs, you, uh, you, uh, HVAC, all the, the above. I'm worried that even though our intent and the verbal uh, agreement that we have that we don't want to, to uh, privatize because of starving some of the things people are going to say well I'd rather not go to that because it doesn't have proper services they don't have updated equipment uh, and it leads me right into another question is is that uh, there are uh, over 40,000 vacancies at any time in any moment in the VA this morning there were 138 positions posted on USA's jobs in my state 138. Uh, I've got pulmonologists, cardiologists in Huntington, psychology in Beckley, practitioners in Martinsburg. We're hurting all over the board. So even though the intent might not be there, it looks like the signs were moving in that direction because of demand from our veterans. If our veterans aren't getting the care, they're going to say, I just need better care. I'm not getting it. And the facility is not worth even going to because it's not in good enough shape. So you can see the concern, Mr. Secretary, of what we have and what we have to answer to. They're still totally overwhelmingly supportive of the VA. Well, let me, let me take uh, your comments in seriatim. Uh, first, I would be lying to you if I told you that we are anywhere near turning the corner on capital investment. My estimate is that we need $60 billion over the next five years to come up to speed. That is an incredible number. But let me tell you what else we're dealing with. More than half of the buildings that I'm responsible for age and range from over 50 years to 100 years. Sure. Um, but this committee has provided the way forward. Uh, we are now engaged, and I believe it was Senator Moran's idea, with market assessments of our national infrastructure and our human resource needs that will then inform when they are done what this committee told us to create, and that is the Asset Infrastructure Review Commission, to bring our facilities up to speed where the veterans are. Um, again, this is a monumental problem. My first job is to do as much as I can to ensure that the basic health needs of the veterans are taken care of. Um, and unfortunately, there are cost-benefit analyses that have to be made, and I can't come to you and say, give me $60 billion to repair all of those facilities. As for the human resource side, you're absolutely right. Um, but let me tell you where we have been and where we are headed. Um, my first week in office, uh, I had two senior leaders give me two different numbers as to how many employees we had. Now, that's outrageous. And I asked a military question, where's your Manning document? A Manning document in the military is one where you have your requirements and you have the people to match them. We never had one. So finally, we now have a modern HR team, HR team in place that has come on in the last few months at my direction. I've consolidated, or in the process of consolidating, 140 individual HR offices into 18 so that we have an even distribution of resources across the enterprise. Um, we have asked for the resources to hire 13,000 people. As Senator Tester knows, uh, my emphasis as the head of VA has been for rural America, rural America and Native America. Um, those two sections of the country that provide the highest per capita number of men and women in uniform, and for the native populations, the, the population that provides the highest number of holders of the medal, medals of honor and combat decorations. So um, it is a complex problem. As I said, I would be lying to you if I think we're anywhere near turning the corner, but I, I understand it. Let me just say, and I'm sorry my time is up, but I just want to make this comment. I, I speak to veterans all over my state and, and anywhere I can, uh, and I tell them, I says, I do not believe that we intend to build 
brand new VA facilities. But they say, can't you at least take care of what we have? That's the biggest concern they might have. And I would hope that you all would understand that they are scared to death that they're being set up, that this thing is going to go private because the demand will switch. Demand will switch if the facilities are not adequate enough to give them the service they need. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, let me I'm may so ask your indulgence. One, that means we have to be much more creative. And Senator Tillis is here, and he has one of the fastest growing veterans population sure. in the country. In Fayetteville, uh, my hometown, which sits underneath Fort Bragg, um, two massive VA facilities. The new one is leased. Uh, the VA center uh, director doesn't have to worry about HVAC, doesn't have to worry about the lawn, concentrates on taking care of veterans. We have to be more creative in terms of two things. One, how we manage our infrastructure, which Mission Act tells us to do better. And two, giving more incentives, and I, I want to come to this committee and talk about it, have some, something like a, a Veterans Peace Corps to get medical professionals out into areas like rural West Virginia, Western North Carolina, and, and provide the means to serve those veterans in communities that are hard to reach, yet provide the, the highest percentage of service of anyone in the country. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. I guess I imagine. Senator Kramer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for, for being here. Thank you for our previous discussion and, and to all of uh, those that are with you. I'll, I'll ask my question specifically to you, and, and uh, you can defer them to others if it's more appropriate. But you mentioned, you've, you've talked a fair bit in your testimony about alternatives to pain management, uh, alternatives certainly to, opi to, to opioids. Um, and you talked about some things like acupuncture and, and uh, other types of care. But you didn't mention uh, hyperbaric oxygen treatment, uh, chamber treatment, and um, particularly for pain. Uh, we've found it to be quite effective, I think, in, in other types of treatments, particularly uh, uh, post-traumatic stress, uh, you know, brain injuries, uh, things common to veterans and, and athletes and others. But um, just wonder why and what do you think the potential is for, for that? Well, it, it certainly wasn't for, for lack of appreciation of the um of the treatment, and I, I pledge to you that I will be out in, in Fargo to look at uh, the headquarters of one of America's mm -hmm. largest hyperbaric chambers. No, we, we have to be more creative, particularly as, as treatments become uh, more complex for more complex injuries, particularly the injuries of the brain. I think we're not, we're not even at the Sputnik stage <laughs> when it comes to exploring the brain and how it responds to trauma, how it recovers. And Dr. Stone is probably the better expert when it comes to the, the actual medical conditions mm -hmm. that, that that treatment addresses. Certainly as a, a practitioner who spent much of my career doing wound management, the hyperbaric oxygen is something we've worked with for a long time. But using hyperbaric oxygen to actually heal the brain or to, to do some of the work that you've uh, been discussing is uh, work that's been studied for at least a decade um, uh, in both the DOD as well as in VA. Uh, what we know is that hyperbaric oxygen has a, chambers have a dramatic effect in improvement uh, of, um, of individuals with both PTSD as well as brain injuries. What we don't understand is what the addition of oxygen mm -hmm. to the presence in that chamber does. And so uh, there's been multiple studies done by all three uniform services, as well as by the VA demonstrating that. And we look forward to further research on it. Uh, brain rest uh, remains one of the mainstays at this time. And certainly going into a chamber where there is silence uh, has, uh, has gr is great value. Uh, whether the addition of oxygen under pressure uh, remains in debate. That would be interesting to see carried out because my understanding is that you know the presence of more oxygen could have the alternative uh, impact because of course it's stimulated I, I would guess. S Senator I agree with you and as, as a practitioner who's done <laughs> wound management in the presence of uh, trying to penetrate oxygen into wounds um, that's exactly correct. Well Whether we'd love to help you brain. with that experimentation in Fargo but we can talk further about that later. The, the other thing I wanted to mention because you mentioned it both in your testimony and in your answer to Senator Manchin you talked about 13,000 more um, people um, 
and we're, you're in the people business. You're, you, you, it requires practitioners to do the work that you do, and they do it very well. And by the way, they do it really well in Fargo. We're very pleased and proud of, of the service they provide our veterans. Um, but it's getting harder to find good people and to, to attract them, to keep them, and particularly in, a, in an economy like North Dakota has, as you, you're aware. Um, it, it's, even, it's even really elevated there. The challenge is, is uh, amplified, I think, in, a, in an economy and in a region uh, like ours, and probably like other rural, rural states. That said, can you, can you elaborate a little bit on specific programs, whether it's loan repayments, or what are, what are some of the tools that you'd have available or that we could you know, help you with to attract and maintain and keep good people? Well, uh, I will say the chairman and the ranking member inserted into the Mission Act uh, the, real, the first monumental step in, in addressing uh, the needs of rural veterans by giving us the authority, extra authorities on relocation pay um, uh, reimbursement, um, the, the ability to pay off uh, medical school loans up to $200,000. Um, those are absolutely needed. Um, my goal, though, is to, uh, try to, even, to try to create even a more robust uh, relationship with our universities and also with the armed services. Uh, General Bradley's goal was to have at least half of the doctors and nurses coming off of active duty coming into VA. Um, General Madison and I spoke a great deal about that. We are now telling doctors that when they decide to leave active service, come to VA to continue your, your service um, to those who have, who have worn the uniform. Um, I, wa I want to go back to the future on that, but this committee has given us a start, particularly when it comes to rural America. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chamber for all his games. It must work some for him. He's a pretty good quarterback. <laughs> I just heard that. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> Sounds good. Mr. Moran. No, no Blumenthal. Blumenthal. Mr. Blumenthal, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I hesitate to interrupt uh, Senator Moran, but I will. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Moran. Thank you. Secretary Wilkie and your team for being here today. I want to congratulate and thank you on your announced decision that you would not be appealing the ruling of the court in the Blue Water Navy case. Well, I think your recommendation will be key. It is instrumental. I would, perhaps with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, uh, express on my behalf, and I hope on behalf of the Committee on Veterans Affairs, that that recommendation be adopted and endorsed heartily to bring fairness and justice to our Blue Water Navy veterans. It would culminate a crusade that has been bipartisan, involving almost everyone on this committee. It's been a team effort, and I'm grateful to you for making that recommendation. I also want to submit for your consideration the Agent Orange Exposure Fairness Act, which would extend the basic principles of that court decision and uh, suggest also that there are other toxic chemicals and poisons on today's battlefield that are worth the research and attention that the VA should give them in deciding what kinds of benefits and disability compensation our veterans deserve. The potential for poisons on the battlefield is one of the great challenges of our time, one of the areas of unknown consequences to our heroes in uniform. And as the father of two veterans who have fought in recent wars uh, and a friend of many, uh, I hope that we can carry forward the spirit of that court decision and of your support for it. Uh, I want to move to the Veterans Affairs um, health care system, most especially in particular the VA facility in West Haven. I think you're familiar with my letters to you on this topic. I understand that 
uh, sterilization processes there essentially have been stalled so that the operating facilities are at one-third of capacity. To put it very bluntly, two-thirds of the veterans who need surgery at the West Haven facility are either sent elsewhere or their surgeries are del delayed or possibly denied. And that is because the sterilization capacity is limited. The surgical facilities were closed for about three months because of flooding. They're back open now, but the tools and equipment used in those surgeries cannot be properly sterilized. A mobile trailer is planned for a year from now. That's way too long. A permanent facility five years from now, much too long. I'd like to know what the plans are, Mr. Secretary, for expediting the availability of that surgical capacity, in other words, the sterilization process facility. Now, I know how important West Haven is. Dr. Stone um, is, is supervising that. I do want to step back, though, and say I agree with you um, in some of your earlier statements about the burn pits. We don't want to go through what we went through with Agent Orange. I certainly saw that in my family. Um, I work for Senator Tillis on the burn pit registry legislation that he and Senator Klobuchar um, introduced and had passed a few years ago, so it's important to me, and I'll let Dr. Stone talk about West Haven. Thank you. Senator, we appreciate your role and your activism in, in this, in the recovery of West Haven. Uh, clearly, this is, goes back to the fact that this is an older facility. We've got a steam line running underneath the sterilization area, um, and as we've worked to recover that facility, uh, let me reassure you that the surgery being performed in that facility today is safe and sterilization is a safe process. I don't One, doubt that it's safe, and I want to emphasize that the docs, physicians, staff are doing their best. They have one hand tied behind their back. In no way are they compromising the safety or effectiveness of the surgeries they do. They are to be commended, but I think the VA here is failing them by failing to expedite the sterilization processes, which limits their capacity. So my understanding is that the mobile trailers that will bring the ionized water and the sterilization uh, materials in will be installed by June of this year, and that the major holdup was because of utility issues on that, that area as well as the building of the trailer. Uh, the actual funding of a new sterilization facility uh, will take three to five years. Uh, that said, my expectation is that as soon as that f uh, mobile unit is installed this June, we will begin to recover uh, the uh, surgery that needs to be done at that facility. Will it go to 100%? That's my intention, absolutely. Can you make that commitment? I have, uh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'll make it. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and I'd like to continue our conversation. My time has expired. I thank the chairman about the possibility of expediting a more permanent facility, but I appreciate your commitment today. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, and Senator Tester for conducting this hearing. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. Uh, I join uh, both the ranking member and the chairman in expressing my gratitude for your continued service to those in uniform, and I appreciate the job that you're doing at the Department of Veterans Affairs. I'll have a chance uh, in Senator uh, Bozeman's uh, Appropriations Subcommittee here in a few days to have more conversations about the spending and the budget uh, recommendations. I have a couple of things that uh, I think are, are timely that I want to ask you today while I have this chance. Um, first of all, I'd like to highlight for you, um, in 2014, we authored legislation. We're now working with Senator Brown of Ohio in furthering this legislation, but the National Academy of Medicine was required to do a toxic exposure analysis to determine if there's any medical and scientific evidence related to or whether there needs to be further study on this topic of the relationship between uh, affliction, uh, problems now, challenges that uh, following generations of the, of the serviceman or woman now face uh, as a result of that toxic exposure, and we look forward to continuing to, to find the answer to that question. There may be a whole other generation. I'm, it saddens me because I can't imagine anyone serve their country thinking they may harm their children or their grandchildren by their service. 
but that very well may be the case, and we're working to get the medical and, and scientific evidence to demonstrate that. I also want to highlight a piece of legislation that uh, Senator uh, Tester led, and I joined him in, in introducing related to uh, mental health and suicide prevention. And I look forward to getting input from all my colleagues uh, with, with Senator Tester's leadership on that's this the, stuff. That's the, and, uh, that's the reserve and guard issue. It's actually, there's two of them. That's, that is one of them. And, and uh, in addition to that, uh, the Commander John Scott Han Hannon Veterans Med Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Act uh, John Scott Hannon being a, a, a veteran who lived in the state of Montana. For my two questions on the timeliness of uh, this hearing, um, staff of this committee, the House committee, and, and the staff of our individual senators on the committees met with your staff in regard to the Veterans Hearing Aid Access and Assistance Act. For as poorly as Senator Tester and I get along, this is another one that uh, he and I uh, sponsored. It was passed into law in December of 2016. Uh, and the takeaway from that meeting, well, first of all, I should indicate that that, that legislation in 2016, the law uh, mandates that uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, determine criteria for her, uh, hearing aid specialists, uh, then with the goal of integrating them into the care of veterans that the VA serves. But the uh, unfortunate circumstance is that since 2016, we can find no evidence of the VA taking any steps to implement that mandate. And the, the meetings that, that I think I would describe the takeaway as little interest in, in meeting that mandate. And I highlight, and, and the reason it's timely is that we ask for a response from VA officials by today's hearing, knowing that you would be here, and we've received none uh, to date. Uh, perhaps Dr. Stone, he appears to be interested in talking about this conversation. Senator, thank you. I appreciate it. And I was unaware of the letter. Um, if, if we have not responded, you have my apologies. We will correct that today. I had intended to send a letter. We didn't send a letter. It was a conversation with officials at the VA saying, okay, but the secretary is going to be here uh, on Tuesday. Could you please get back to us by then? Otherwise, we need to raise this topic with the secretary. So uh, you ha happen to be looking at a hearing compromised veteran from my combat service. So I'm deeply appreciative of what the VA has brought to me and my family as we've sought care for by hearing loss due to combat. So I, I'm well aware of, of the issues that you bring up. And let me say to you that we last year performed over a million visits for hearing compromised veterans uh, with our audiologists and our technicians. Uh, we have continued to grow that. We refer out about 38,000 visits a year um, and we appreciate the legislation on hearing aid specialists. But it, the question is, uh, do we need to move into the specialist area? Clearly, um, you and I may have a different understanding of the role of the specialist. Today, I have enough audiologists and an, an, enough uh, technicians in order to provide uh, that vast, vast majority of the care that's needed, including uh, less than a 10-day waiting period in order for veterans to come in uh, for care or for their appliances. In addition, we have an under two-week waiting period in order to take outside prescriptions and fill them on behalf of the veterans. Let me suggest this, Dr. Stone, that maybe with Senator Tester and I's staff, we could have this conversation in the zero seconds I have left. Mr. Secretary, I'm in Emporia, Kansas on Saturday, four days from now. Emporia has a CBOC. The CBOC has two days of service, uh, rarely has a physician, has a mid-level practitioner. Uh, the, the department, the Eastern uh, uh, Division in Kansas has announced the closure of that CBOC. Uh, one would expect me to be angry about the closure of that CBOC. Uh, I am hopeful that with the closure of the CBOC and conversations with the VA, that the Mission Act now provides additional opportunities for care for veterans because we go from a two-day CBOC with virtually, with, with often no physician and one mid-level to an opportunity for a multitude of community resources being available to those veterans in that area. I'm gonna meet with your, your, your folks in Kansas are joining me in Emporia on Saturday. What message would you like for me to deliver about the opportunities that Mission or the VA now can provide? Mission Act is about veteran-centric care. It's not about protecting the institution or guarding the status quo. It is about giving that veteran the option to be uh, the guardian of his own 
or her own future. And for rural America, offering a, the widest aperture possible on access to medical care is, is meeting the attention of this committee. And um, as long as we keep the veterans' health at the center of everything that we do, then um, the system will work. I will convey that to those veterans who join me on Saturday. Mr. Chairman, thank you. In keeping with our bipartisan committee commitment, I'm going to excuse myself for just a minute and turn it over to Senator Tester uh, to continue the hearing. And it's also his turn to ask questions. So I'll be back in just a second, Senator Tester. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I assume that means I can just expand the time that I used. It means you have to behave. Apparently. Oh, I have to behave, damn it. Thank you all for being here uh, once again. Um, I hesitate to, to talk history uh, with somebody who probably knows history far better than I do, especially military history. But nonetheless, this is pretty elementary. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, this country did not want to go to war. Uh, President Roosevelt um, turned our car factories into airplane manufacturing and prepared for war. And uh, then came the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and we were ready for war. Um, Pretty simple, pretty ingenious. Um, everybody on this committee, uh, I believe, has said uh, no privatization. All the VSOs have said no privatization. Uh, the president has said something different. You have said no privatization, and your staff has also said that. But as the questions are asked here today, and I've talked about our vacancies in Montana, Manchin talked about his vacancies, his facilities uh, that needed improved uh, improvement. Blumenthal talked about West Haven that was one-third capacity. Even Senator Moran, even though he's not mad about it, is talking about a CBOC that's going to be closed because of lack of staffing. Everything that I'm hearing and everything I'm seeing says something different. And then I look at the budget, and the budget, and you had said earlier that you needed $60 billion in capital investment. And the budget request for major and minor construction was in, decreased by 43% for major construction and 50% for minor construction. And, and we're talking about the needs that are out there. And by the way, we can go down the list in Montana. It's, it's pretty, pretty reflective. And I was at the meeting six days ago when you guys said you can't get the money out the door, but nonetheless, you talked about $60 billion in capital expenditures, and we're reducing those accounts by 40 and 50 percent. Putting all that together, how, how, how can we justify that? So, Senator Tester, I could uh, probably uh, shed some light on that. First, let me say, as a department CFO, um, I feel dirty not asking for more money, to be honest. But um, the, well, the, the issue fact isn't just asking for more money. I don't care if you ask for more money, but if you got $60 billion in needs over the next five years and we're reducing those same accounts that will meet those capital expenditures, uh, something doesn't jive. That's all. So, so let me explain. And so I was, that was being a little bit facetious. The fact of the matter is we do have a requirement. There's no question. Uh, we have older facilities and we have a substantial facility requirement. Uh, as you know, we had a substantial plus up in 18 and 19. Uh, the fact of the matter is that we sort of very quickly executed our shovel-ready projects, uh, and they are in the works. And we are at a point now uh, when you sort of divide the amount of money we have in the works by the number of facilities, we have about 19 to 20 projects per facility going. And they have limited capacity in, in a lot of areas of moving clinics around, moving people around. And we're now hearing from a number of uh, facilities, they have uh, actually some shovel-ready projects, they just can't execute because it's too disruptive. Uh, we're going to end up carrying some of that money forward. Uh, from 19 into 20, we're going to carry about a billion dollars of the plus up in NRM. Uh, we're also going to carry some minor construction money forward. Gotcha. So, so I'm going to do some quick math for you. Not that you don't know this already. You divide 60 by 5, it's $12 billion a year. And and if that need is out there and we can't execute the amount of money we've got so far, how do we not privatize the VA? Well, um, we, we don't privatize the VA because um, we still have the largest health care system in the country. I got it. 170 hospitals. Yep. Um, and our veterans are voting with their feet. Let me, let me just say, this is not a libertarian VA. 
Um, if it were, I would be giving myself a card that says veteran and I go out in the private sector and get anything I want. I hear it. That's not, that is not happening. And um, again, I, I fall back, not on anecdote, but on the stats. Yes. Our veterans are happy. They're going where people speak their language and their culture. I support that, and, and this committee supports Mr. it. Mr. Secretary, uh, and I agree with you, but I go back to the example of history. If, if we're short on manpower, if our facilities are short and substandard, if we're not making the HVAC additions that we need to do, eventually those veterans are going to the VA are going to say, nope, not anymore. Well, I, I, you gave me the, you, you're, this committee gave me the answer. Yes. And that is the market assessments. Yes. And then the asset infrastructure review committee, which does exactly what you says, said. And I think I'm going to come to you and ask to accelerate the beginning of that commission. Of the AIR so, Act? Yes, so that it moves more rapidly than uh, the timeline that this committee has and, given. And really quick, just, uh, and I don't have a problem with that. Can you give me an idea on how quick you're, because it's set to go into effect 2021 or 2022. Okay. And, and I would like to do that earlier because our market assessments are already underway. I would love to visit with you about yeah. that moving forward. Okay. Um, and now we have Senator Bozeman. Thank you uh, very much. And we do appreciate you and Senator Isaacson. We can be very proud that the 2019 appropriations, because of uh, your two's leadership in the committee, was, uh, was significantly increased. And I think, uh, again, we're going to see that uh, going into the next fiscal year. So we appreciate your leadership, Secretary Wilkie, and your team, uh, especially in uh, grappling with the forever GI Bill and getting that under control. I know that was a, uh, a hard thing to do. Uh, also, your work with the veteran suicide. Uh, I think that uh, we're, we're coming up with a uh, a method now that uh, is going to have uh, significant results. So we really do appreciate that and appreciate that in your leadership style, again, with your team. Um, one thing I'd like to, to understand, I was in Arkansas last week uh, in a lot of our smaller communities and, and uh, that will be impacted by the Mission Act. And I guess what I'd like to understand is that, that uh, there's a little bit of confusion as to what's going to happen in June. So we'll have the rules and regulations in place uh, going forward. Uh, for the veteran in Mountain Home, Arkansas, has been told he's ineligible for a choice because of the nearby location of the CBOC, even though it doesn't provide the medical service he needs. What, what's going to happen to him in June, if anything? Uh, will he be able to talk to VI in June 6 to get authorized for care from a private hospital? or? What, what's, the, what's the process? The, the process is that the veteran will continue to talk to his provider or his scheduler in order to uh, really authorize care and make the best decision on behalf of the veteran. Uh, it, frankly, June 6 should almost be a non-event for the veteran. Today we authorize, well, today uh, we will do over 300,000 visits in our direct care system we will authorize about 50,000 visits in the community care system. That is all done on a manual basis by our providers and schedulers. On uh, June 6th, it is our hope to have something called a decision support tool that will automate that process. Should we fail with the decision support tool, it will look just exactly like it does today. Now there will be an enhanced number of veterans uh, eligible to make a decision of whether they want to go out to the, for care or not. But the system will look very similar to what it does today uh, as far as a veteran sitting in front of a provider or a scheduler or on the phone uh, making a decision on whether they stay or they go out for care. So for those that are eligible on June 6th for theoretically for enhanced care in the sense that, you know, that, that uh, they're going to fall into the new parameters. If they call, will they be told, do this and this, or will they be said, will it be, we're phasing this in, call back, or? Uh, Senator, this will, will be, they will be told what they need to do for care. There should be no increase 
in wait times. There should be no increase in wait for care. Now, our problem is, and in most areas of America, the commercial health care system is not as responsive as we are. Please remember of those 300,000 visits we're going to conduct today, over 22% are same-day visits. So the, in the commercial space, it is not as responsive as the Secretary has said previously. Uh, in an urban area uh, in the southeast, uh, it was found that the wait time for the commercial space was dramatically higher than ours. Uh, I'd like to talk. And again, mine, mine was more in context of the travel time versus the wait time, but, but we'll talk about that. The uh, veteran suicide, the collaboration with uh, these groups that seem to be doing a good job. Uh, the secretary and I were in a meeting earlier this morning, and one of the congressmen talked about a program that they had a 70% reduction in suicide as a result of. Can you talk about the efforts of the collaboration so that we can get uh, th these public-private partnerships going that seem to seem to work well. Again, we need to, to make sure the metrics are there and all of those things. But yes, sir. So the, the budget calls for $222 million for suicide prevention programs. I have just been named as uh, the chair of the National Task Force on Suicide Prevention. Um, you know the, the terrible statistics. 20 veterans a day right. take their lives. 14 of those are outside of our VA. Uh, I think the most important part of um, the task force, other than a whole health approach to suicide prevention, is the opening of the window for monies to flow into the states and localities um, to help us find those veterans. Example, I was in Alaska with Senator Sullivan. More than half of the veterans in Alaska are not in the VA system. I asked the Alaska Federation of Natives to double the number of VA tribal representatives that they have to go out into the hinterland of Alaska and help us find those veterans who are not in their system. It sounds simple. Um, sometimes simple solutions are the better solutions. Um, the states and localities know better than we do in many of these instances where, where veterans are and where they are in need. A um, couple of things. Um, I'm not going to give you a metric saying that we're going to achieve zero suicides. Um, the majority of veterans who take their own lives have our Vietnam era, my father's generation. Some of these Americans have problems that began building when Lyndon Johnson was president. Uh, we're not going to be able to cure all of that. But we can, and, and if I, the chair, chair will indulge me, as the former Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel, General Mattis and I both began a system of education throughout an individual's military career that focused on mental health wellness and, and taught a soldier, sailor, airman, Marines to look for the signs of danger. Um, so that for the first time in our military history, we actually have people coming out of the service who at least have had some educational grounding throughout their term of service in what to look for, when to ask for help, not only for themselves but for others. So um, the deepening of the relationship between VA and DOD is absolutely essential so we never again have those numbers that we have now that began to build um, in Southeast Asia 50 years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you for recommending uh, that, that the Blue Water decision not be appealed. At this point, appealing that decision is not what we should be using our resources for. So use your persuasive powers to make sure that that happens. There was an article recently. Oh, by the way, uh, I understand that the chairman is going to have a hearing later on the um, your proposed access standards. That's good because uh, a lot of us have expressed concerns about how those standards were developed and the fact that we heard from many VSOs that they were not consulted during that process. So th that will be happening in April, I understand. Uh, a few weeks ago, Mr. Secretary, the New York Times published a story with the heading, quote, it, quote treat it like a piece of meat, female veterans endure harassment at the VA. Have you read that article? 
So uh, it, it paints a pretty dire picture of the kind of experiences and harassment that uh, the women veterans who go to the VAs endure. So uh, what is the VA going to do to make sure women veterans are respected by the VA staff and other patients? I realize that there needs to be some kind of a cultural change, but I don't know, posting signs, whatever you need to do so that uh, this is not the horrendous experience where the women veterans as described in this article. And uh, I wanna know whether the VA is conducting any research into the best practices or models of care that increase women veterans utilization of and satisfaction of VA services. And uh, your testimony mentions that 91% of VA's community-based outpatient clinics have a women's health primary care provider. And when can we expect that number to be 100% because you're almost there. Can you well, respond to those Well, that's three? certainly the goal. And in our, Senator, in our previous relationship from my former capacity as the Under Secretary of Defense, uh, you and I discussed that uh, the first thing that I had to do as the Under Secretary was promulgate the first DOD regulations on sexual harassment um, mm -hmm. and equal opportunity, which we did. So that tells you my commitment. You hit on it, it's a cultural change. I don't believe that what was in the New York Times story uh, is apparent in all of our VA facilities. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to tell you with a straight face that I can change the attitudes of, of every person who works in VA, but we are changing the culture. Um, we're putting in women's health centers in all of our VA hospitals. One of my goals is to make sure that there is an actual privacy barrier, uh, separate entrances, um, that in the case of this New York Times story, those things will probably less likely occur just by changing the way we bring our women veterans into the system. Um, I can say that we now, uh, we had 500,000 appointments last year for women's veterans. That is a sea change. Um, I will also say that the culture that you talked about is now beginning to change within DOD. I think the longer that that goes on, the less likely you will see an end product such as you described um, in VA. Um, but I think we're we are on the right path. Well, one would think that when you make those cultural changes that you may not need to uh, expend resources on separate kinds of facilities, but obviously that is something that the women veterans uh, uh, very clearly uh, want at this point. I want to get to the the lack of progress that I've heard on various VA healthcare projects. Uh, for example, the advanced leeward outpatient healthcare access, the Aloha project in Hawaii on Oahu was scheduled for a lease award early calendar year 2018. 2018, but has been delayed a number of times and a lease has still not been awarded. And the project was scheduled to be completed originally by fiscal year 2020. And I know that uh, these kinds of outpatient clinics are really helpful because they're usually closer to where the veterans live. And in Hawaii, the, uh, the Tripler Hospital is very uh, crowded and you can hardly get any parking and it's a pain in the Akole, as we say in Hawaii. So, you know, uh, can you commit to seeing that the Aloha project is completed on time with no further additional delays? Senator, um, as you know, I, I spent a um, great deal of time in Hawaii uh, last year. I talked with the governor about this lease. I will get you more information. Um, my understanding was that there were contractual problems with those responsible for, for improving um, the facility. Um, that was what I discussed back in December uh, in Honolulu, but I will, I will get you more information on Thank that. Thank you, because I'd like to see this and other uh, CVOX come, uh, come through. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Ono. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you all for, for being here. And Secretary Wilkie, I thank you for the time you've spent with me prior to this to talk about the needs that some of our veterans in, in Tennessee have and uh, to look at how we fulfill that promise of uh, providing for them and for their health care. I want to start with the EHRs and your deployment, the modernization that you were doing there. As we've talked, many of our folks um, would like very much to be able to, under the Mission Act, seek that 
uh, care at home because they are a good distance away from a facility. And uh, as we've talked before, interoperability is an imperative in making this work. And um, I want to know uh, where you are, what control measures you have that have been uh, implemented to ensure that you are going to meet your milestones as you go through this deployment, as that begins to take place. Senator, we will go live in March of next year in, our, in the Pacific Northwest uh, to reach our initial operating sites. Um, that is on schedule. Uh, there are issues that we need to work our way through. These are old facilities. We need to rebuild our communication closets, and that's going to go on this summer. Uh, we also need to work our way through all of the uh, internet of medical devices and make sure that they are appropriate. Okay, let me ask you this. As you are doing that, are you working on a plan so that when someone enlists day one, they begin a cloud-based encrypted record that will follow them the rest of their life. Yes. That, that, that is the goal. Um, I, use okay, my father, so I use my father as an example. The days of somebody carrying around an 800-page paper record are gone. Right. But I think it would be instructive and helpful to us if you could provide us with your timeline of when you're going to achieve this. Now, in HELP Committee today, they are doing a hearing on the EHRs. and. We know that whatever you do, that you have to have a strategy so that this is going to be interoperable with commercial best practices. And uh, do you have that in place? Uh, yes, we do. And um, obviously, you, you mentioned the goal is to begin building that record the minute that young American walks into a military entrance processing station. And then there is a handoff. I expect, um, and I don't know when there will be new changes in leadership at the Department of Defense, that I will continue the relationship that I had with General Mattis. Um, I expect to come to this committee uh, with the announcement of a joint program office, which will be the first, I believe, the first joint program office between two departments so that we combine the resources of both departments to build this record. Okay. It will be interoperable. I, didn't, I would have never approved it if it, if it could not be interoperable with the private sector. Okay. Um, telehealth. Um, I was recently in Gallatin, Tennessee to open a veterans clinic there, and it's one of the whole of life clinics. And uh, the day after that was over at the Nashville VA for the new mental health center. We were walking uh, through that. Um, and I think that those um, are important components to have. Uh, because the telehealth helps to bring those services to them, especially in behavioral health. And um, I want to know how you are, what is your strategy and your timeline on moving more facilities so they're functioning with telehealth and have that whole of life approach uh, to the clinic? We've got a lot of clinics, people cannot get to healthcare long waiting list, and this helps to speed the process. You're exactly correct. Uh, about uh, three quarters of a million veterans consumed telehealth visits last year. Uh, that's about 13% of the veterans that are enrolled with us. This year's budget will move that to 20%. Uh, we believe that in order to keep veterans in their homes, especially at-risk veterans, uh, instead of hospitalization, Expanding uh, telehealth services is absolutely essential. So uh, we, we will move to 20% under this budget. And, and I would say this committee has given us authority that no other healthcare system in the country has, and it allows our doctors to practice across state lines. Um, this is the front line of our attack on the problems of mental health, as you mentioned, with behavioral health. Um, it provides our veterans with the opportunity to stay at home, stay in a comforting surrounding, and, and stay with people um, who, who look after them, their friends, their families, without forcing them to go into a larger facility. 
I, I appreciate that. I know my time has expired. I just want to say, listening to you all, and as you talk about the budget and you talk about urgent needs, things should never have gotten into this shape. Never. And it comes from mismanagement. And my hope is, as you set these timelines for implementing technologies that are going to enable greater access, that you also are utilizing technology to make certain that there is not the gross mismanagement that has taken place in times past. Senator Murray. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Wilkie and your team for, for being here. Um, let me start with the fact, caregivers, I'm sure you're shocked I'm going there, but um, the October 1st deadline that the caregivers IT system uh, was to be certified and begin the expansion process is quickly approaching and the VA still has a lot of work to do before then. We have now heard rumors in the press and in briefings that the VA might not make that deadline and I do really appreciate your personal understanding of the challenges caregivers face. I know you can appreciate how much our prior era caregivers and veterans need this support but for the record will you meet the October 1st deadline to certify the IT system and begin expanding eligibility for the caregivers program? Uh, I, if I don't, uh, I will be back up here. Um, but let me take a step back. The reason that I made the decision not to remove anyone from the caregiver program was because of not only your, your work and your insistence, uh, but because this process has been mismanaged in the past. Mm -hmm. So that was the right thing to do. Um, and that's why I made that decision based on your recommendation. Um, the date is October 1st. The statute says that I have to certify that the system is working. If I do not certify that, no one will be removed. Uh, we will continue to manually process the checks um, right now, there are 24,000 stipends that go out. It is manually done. But as long as those checks get to our veterans, um, that is fine with me. Um, we, do, uh, we do have a new commercial off-the-shelf technology. And I, if you have not been briefed, I will get you someone okay. to brief it um, that we brought on board on February 22nd. Uh, that is the template that we'll be using, hopefully. Uh, to be ready on October 1st. Um, the, the other side of this is that we have increased the budget um, primarily because of your work uh, to about $720 million. Uh, I expect that to go up in the next few years, but we're also using that money to hire uh, professionals to, to staff out our caregiver program. Okay. I Senator, if I might add, um, this is a manual program today, uh, and there are over 24,000 families receiving benefits. Their checks are manually written every day. As we move to this commercial off-the-shelf software system, what we will need to do is to migrate all of the data over and then assure that we can then on an automated basis write the checks every month before we're ready to expand. And although we've made a decision on the software system, uh, the migration of that data, uh, we have not recommended a certification date yet on the software system and the expansion. I'm, I'm not going to do it unless it's right. Okay. I, I appreciate that. And um, at, at first glance, your request for caregivers looks strong and appears comprehensive. However, several components of the program are in need of resources. You mentioned staffing, the IT system, the planned expansion of support services provided to caregivers. All of those will need increase during expansion, and your budget requests $150 million for expansion of the caregivers program, leaving $555 million for the needs of the existing program. And as I have made clear in previous settings, I want to be sure this request is not individually underfunding expansion or the needs of the existing program. So I wanted to ask you, how will this funding, especially for the expansion, be allocated to end which areas of need? So the basic management structure of this program was done at individual medical centers, resulting in dramatically different criteria for inclusion and removal from the program. The first thing you'll see is a stand-up of a regionalized uh, management system to look at uh, who's eligible, 
and who will be removed, uh, and no one will be removed until we can assure you that we're doing this in a clear manner that is transparent to America's veterans and to the American people. As we stand up that regionalized process that will occur under the chief medical officer of each vision, we will move from the individual caregiver being the gatekeeper of this program to a regionalized board process and then institute an appeal process uh, at the uh, VA central office. So the, the entire management structure in order to do this to the secretary standards and the standards that you expect uh, needs to be stood up and put together. We've introduced this concept to the vision leadership uh, last week and have begun talking to the chief medical officers about the hiring and stand up of this system. Now, let me, let me, the last thing I'll say, Senator, I, I've used your time. Um, we are retraining our clinical staff across the country um, with the most modern uh, techniques and information on how to deal with families and, and caregivers. I, I would say that I think VA is really the only um, healthcare system in the country that's concentrated on this uh, as the son of a Vietnam soldier. It's, it's vital to me, so. Okay, I appreciate it, and it's, I know you, this is something you personally care about too. As you know, I'm gonna stay absolutely on top of this. We want it implemented, we wanna implement it correctly. We do not wanna deny people uh, this care that they have been waiting for, this help and this support, and I uh, appreciate your response today, but we'll uh, stay in close touch, and I yes, thank you very much. I do have other questions, Mr. Chairman, I will submit for the record. Thank you, Senator Murray. Senator Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. Secretary Wilkie, it's great to see you. Um, first off, I want to thank you all for, in your budget request, uh, funds to expand the CBOC down in Jacksonville. How do you see that, uh, well, first off, for people who would suggest that there is a trend in the VA or members of Congress to privatize, it seems like budget requests for the expansion of the CBOC, the opening of a million square feet in three different health care centers in North Carolina with a different model that you mentioned earlier when I was here, seems to suggest that you believe the brick and mortar uh, VA presence is a very, very important part of the future. Um, so I wouldn't, I'd, I'd like for you to maybe touch on that, but tell me how that CBOC expansion in Jacksonville in combination with the, uh, the PAC uh, teams are going to help improve care there, and then how do you leverage the PAC model for the rest of veterans across the country? Well, S Senator, um, let, me, let me talk about uh, business processes that have led us to that stage. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, we are in the process of doing market assessments across the country uh, to lead into the Asset Infrastructure Review Commission. Um, the demographic changes that I see for veterans are changes that um, mirror those in the rest of the country. Uh, by 2027, North Carolina will have the fourth highest number of veterans in the country. It will be begin to nip at the heels of California. And it'll be the eighth largest state. Yes. Um, for those, like Senator Brown just came in, Ohio remains in the top 10. Because of the, the large populations in those, and Georgia's in the top 10, for as far as we can see in the future. Um, we have to be more creative. Uh, we have to not only combine the brick and mortar facilities that we have, we have to manage them more efficiently, but we also have to create an environment where our teams can reach uh, rural areas of our states and, and be more creative when it comes to things like telehealth. Um, but we are moving uh, our resources to where the veterans are. And I think Dr. Stone has your PAC answer. So the PACs will continue to expand uh, across the nation as we hire uh, Montana alone. We have 38 uh, primary care providers. We've got offers out to eight additional uh, primary care providers that will come in and expand that rural area. Uh, the secretary is exactly correct that we're seeing growth in North Florida, we're seeing growth in South Georgia, we're seeing growth in your state, sir, uh, and we'll continue to expand this. Now, let me talk about brick and mortar. Veterans are no different than the rest of Americans. Our parents' generation stayed in the same house on a generational basis. We don't. 
and our children don't. They move. We must be able to move from place to place uh, in, in order to follow where the veterans go. Therefore, lease authorities are incredibly important to us and enhanced lease authorities that would allow us not just to provide housing, but to also uh, be able to provide ambulatory medical facilities that we can move every five to 10 years and to follow where America's veterans are. Much of the non-recurring maintenance that you hear about and the cost of our infrastructure is for our inpatient f facilities. Our inpatient facilities in many cases uh, are aged and need substantial improvements, but our ambulatory facilities, more than a thousand of them, uh, need to be able to be mobile when the veteran moves each decade. Thank you. I want to talk a little bit about access standards in the Mission Act. Um, I think I could infer, at least from some comments from some of my colleagues, that it's almost like we're giving uh, some of our veterans too much choice. Um, in some states, I think you have 100% access to choice if you want it. Um, and there may be a variety of reasons why you need that. My colleague just came in from Alaska. He's got a very diverse population over a geography that almost spans the United States from tip uh, to toe. And so I can see why you have to have a different solution for different states. But what would happen? What would be the negative consequence if uh, Congress succeeded in rolling back the access standards that you're putting in place now in, in uh, combination with the Mission Act? Well, Senator, it would no longer be a veteran-centric, patient-centric approach to health care. Um, that was the clear mandate uh, of the Mission Act, not institutional prerogative, but the health care of a veteran. So let, let me beg the chair's indulgence and describe what this isn't. Uh, and I mentioned it earlier, this is not a libertarian VA. This is not giving Dr. Stone or me a card and saying, thank you very much, go out and find whatever doctor you want and take care of you for the rest of your life. What this says is that if we cannot provide a service, then you have the option to seek that service in the private sector. Give you an example. If there's no rheumatologist, I don't, and there probably is in Fayetteville, and you meet the criteria for that service, then we tell you that you have the option to go to, to Duke or to Chapel Hill or to Cape Fear Valley in my hometown um, to get that to get that service. But it is based on the needs of the veteran, and veterans come first. If we can't do what the veteran needs, then we will provide him the opportunity to seek that. But they, I, I think it's very important, Mr. Chair, just to close out my questions. That's why I think a, a broader understanding of what you're trying to accomplish with the patient-aligned care teams, uh, it's not like you're giving them a card and sending them on their way. I mean, you're going to spend a lot of time making sure that the outcomes are going in the right direction, that they're getting their appointments filled when they need to, and you'll always have that uh, brick and mortar presence if necessary, but I for one think the access standards, we need to continue to move forward and the work that you're layering on top of it is gonna provide a better standard of care for the veterans and I thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tellis. Senator Brown. Um, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Wilkie, um, thanks for your letter back to me regarding uh, the VA History Center at the VA in Dayton, Ohio. We're excited to get the next phase of this project up and running. My staff and I look forward to a briefing on how this project is progressing. We will be in touch with you about that. I'll be brief. I have a number of questions. Senators Tester and Bozeman and I have been working for years to push VA to track and report an overpayment in veteran debt. I've had constituents who have uh, reported a change in status or a dependency to VA and VA didn't take action leading to an overpayment in debt. We're able to get some provisions through last year, as you know. Last week, we introduced our updated bill to clearly outline the reporting process for veterans and their families to foster better interagency coordination to reduce overpayments. I'd like your commitment that VA will continue to work with the three of us. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, over the past month, and this is a bit of a follow-up to Senator Moran's um, comments and question about, um, about toxic exposure. Over the years, you and I have discussed this issue, whether it's Agent Orange or burn pits. It took this country far too long to come to terms with, with Agent Orange, so each veteran didn't have to apply individually and go through that pain. 
Uh, we, I appreciate the decision not to appeal on the Blue Water Navy. That's really important. That, that's my recommendation. So I don't know what other departments are doing. But that's I'm your recommendation, okay. Um, I, I'd like to, my question is this. I, I'd like to know when VA intends to make a decision regarding the National Academy's recommendations on Agent Orange bladder cancer, hyperthyroidism, hypertension, and Parkinson's-like syndromes. Yeah, I, we're working our way through that right now, and uh, it would be my hope within the next 90 days that we'll have some decisions made. Okay. And then you make the decision it quickly is ratified by Secretary Wilkie? Is that uh, how it works? Sir, I would not presume uh, when the Secretary Sitting would right that. next to you, you might ask him. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank sir. you. Okay. Uh, Secretary, thank you for that. You said that Congress put on real expectations on an outdated IT system for the forever GI Bill. Respectfully, sir, the VA's IT and, and programmatic offices should be able to flag these issues for leadership, and leadership should respond accordingly and up, update Congress. I, uh, if I said that, I probably misspoke. I should have said that the VA systems were not capable of handling the changes that Congress mandated. But they will be. Uh, they will be, yes. Okay. Uh, VA went through similar issues with care T for caregivers expansion. Uh, why did that take six to seven months as well? That I can't tell you based on my tenure here. Um, what I dis my short tenure. Um, what I uh, what I can tell you is that once again, uh, because uh, we were not ready to implement um, the programs required to support our caregivers, I made a command decision. Uh, based on my discussions with Senator Murray uh, to make sure that no one was removed from the program, that the checks, the stipends that went out to 24,000 caregiver families were done manually, even, but they were done. And um, I do expect to come to this Congress by the deadline on October 1st, hopefully certifying that the commercial off-the-shelf technology that we purchased to support uh, caregivers is in place. Um, but I will say, I'm not going to certify anything that doesn't work. We've been down that road before. That led to the problems with the Forever GI Bill. That led to the problems with caregiver. Um, so you have my commitment that nothing moves unless we're convinced that it helps veterans. Yeah, uh, thank you. And I, and I, I want to reiterate what the chairman said about the legacy IT systems, getting them to work together to work for all of our veterans. That is so important. Well, one more comment and one last question. Uh, the comment is, well, the question is, when, when can we expect nominees for Deputy Secretary and Undersecretary for Health? When's that going to happen? Uh, hopefully soon. Um, we've made the recommendations, um, and I hope there will be an announcement from the White House shortly. Um, I will thank the committee for, for approving um, the nominees for the Office of Whistleblower Protection and CIO. Um, I do want to say one thing, though. There is an added uh, layer uh, of approval for the Undersecretary for Health. Um, the law, unlike for any other com position in federal government, uh, requires the convening of a commission, a commission to meet, deal with um, um, candidates deliberate and then pass a recommendation on to me. Um, that was the reason for the delay in the eight months that I was here because the commission had to be convened. Last comment, I heard your, um, thank you Mr. Chairman for your forbearance, I, I heard your um, senator, your, your junior senator from North Carolina, uh, his laying out choice and privatization and I know how he stands on that. I been disappointed that you aren't quite as opposed to privatization as I thought you were during the process. I just ask you, I'm not asking a question particularly, but just ask you to listen to the veteran service organizations and what they think about this president's philosophical commitment to privatization that I hope the VA doesn't follow. I will say, Senator, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, um, I think I've been very clear uh, about where I stand and where I think the department is heading. Um, I think the legislation was right on target when it said that the veteran is at the center of everything that we do. Um, I also think that the veteran's voting with his feet uh, or her feet. Um, our customer satisfaction rates are at an all-time high. 
Um, I look at that as the gauge as to how well we are doing. Um, I also believe, and I'm not one to use a lot of anecdotes, but I can say as someone who has spent an entire life in and amongst the military, um, that our veterans, no matter what age they are, will go primarily to some place where people speak the language and understand the culture, uh, because there's nothing like it in the United States. And um, I stand by what I have done uh, in the last eight months. And that, that, uh, that the way that Congress appropriates or withholds money can have a whole lot to do with people voting with their feet, and I hope you'll keep that in mind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sullivan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Secretary and your team. Thank you for being here. Um, I also am interested in the nominees, you know, for undersecretary, very important. So we need to get those out the door. I also want to mention to my Democratic colleagues, they also need not to delay the nominees once they're on the floor. There's been very, very uh, um, unprecedented obstruction of very basic nominees for their confirmation. So. We get them out the door and we'll have guys like Senator Brown move them quickly as opposed to delaying them because that's, that's not helping at all. So it wasn't a nice try. It's actually a really serious issue. So um, they need to help. They can't just say, give us nominees and then delay them for 10 months, right? It's ridiculous and that's what's been happening. Um, let me uh, mention, uh, first of all, congratulations on these national awards. I think that what you're talking about, um, for your team, it uh, should be commended. And you know, sometimes you guys come here, you get the wrath of the Congress, and we rarely recognize when there's been improvement. So I'm gonna recognize it, and I appreciate it. Um, so keep up the good work on these things. Uh, you may have also noticed the Alaska VA healthcare system was uh, also awarded with the most improved inpatient experience for the entire country in 2018. So I want to thank all of you for that. You know, do, the, do, the, Dr. Ballard is one of the best. Dr. America. Ballard does a great job, but it's uh, help from the top. You know, the VA uh, out in the Matsu Valley, a huge veteran population, um, finally has not just one, not just two, but three doctors. It only took five years, but now we have some doctors. Um, so thank you for that. And Mr. Secretary, I also want to thank you. It's not exactly in your purview, but you may have seen my Alaska Native Vietnam Veterans Equity Allotment Act was recently signed into law. And when the president uh, cited the broader bill it was in, he highlighted this very important bill for Alaska that uh, helped our Vietnam veterans overcome a huge injustice. And may the I fact that the president highlighted that in his signing ceremony made me uh, I, I, will, I will add to that, Senator. I, I mentioned that the caregiver legislation closes one of the last loops of the Vietnam era. Sadly, it's been 44 years since the fall of Saigon. Um, I think the Alaska uh, allotment issue was one that um, sadly took almost as long, and I think that also closes a loop, particularly for a state that has the highest per capita number of veterans in the country. Well, I appreciate that, Mr. Secretary. And you, you weighing in on that, former Secretary Zinke weighing in on that. Again, previous administration, uh, reg remarkably, they were opposed to it. So you guys at the cabinet level weighing in really helped make it happen. So thank you for that. I wanted to talk about the, the Veterans Benefits Administration is working on and I know it's a big issue for you, uh, identifying off the VA grid veterans who have yet to make con uh, contact with the VBA and its services. Um, I know you're looking at possibly doing a case study in Alaska. You know, we've been, you've been out there, so thank you, and I look forward to your visit and Dr. Stone's visit here soon um, again. But can you just talk a little bit about that, whether it's the pilot program in Alaska? We do have enormous challenges on this issue, but also how you're working it in other rural communities throughout the country? Certainly. You may recall that at confirmation time when I visited with you, you spoke about your efforts to engage your constituents. And so after I was confirmed, I didn't forget that conversation. And I set in motion to try to figure out how we actually do that. 
our presence augmented by our relationship with the county and state VSOs as well as tribal and communities to better understand how that network should be set up so that if you can't touch us, you can touch somebody who can touch us. And, and that's what we're trying, and we're using Alaska by engaging those groups to figure out exactly how the workings of that take place and what we can do in terms of the ways we communicate and the effectiveness by way we're able to do that. So we're trying to use that as understanding how do we mobilize all the re resources that are in the um, veteran community, um, VSOs included, to figure out how we do those touches and engage folks effectively. How about the pilot program you're looking at in Alaska on this? Exactly? It's just, it's just. I'm happy to come briefing some of the details. We're just getting started in terms of how that all works. Okay, well, I appreciate you guys focusing on that. Uh, Ms. Sector, you know, I know you've been asked earlier by Senator Bozeman and others um, on, on how are you feeling with regard to the Mission Act launch date. You know, Alaska has been carved out its own region. Region 5, uh, there's been some concerns that, you know, we're behind the power curve there a little bit relative to the rest of the country. Can you just give me a quick update on that, how you're feeling about that launch? Uh, actually, because of the uniqueness of the geography and the dispersion of, of the population, I worry about it a lot. Um, we're on schedule, though, for the, the uh, getting out the contract. And so uh, when I say that the bid should be out, I, th I think it's this fall. What can we do to ameliorate your concerns and worries? I share them. Um, I think just the continuing dialogue with your staff and yourself, I'm looking forward to my visit up there where we can dialogue and really walk our way through it. But it is a unique area with geographical challenges, and you are exactly correct in our previous conversations. It should be handled locally. Thank and you. I will add, if, if you go down the list, and, and I've said this to... Um, uh, folks in Alaska, the Federation of Natives, I've said it on Alaska television. If you go down the list and look what we are prototyping in VA, my philosophy on electronic health, on logistics, on, on VBA, and, and here with mission is if we can make it work in Alaska, it will work anywhere because of the unique challenges that Alaska presents by its massive size, but also because of the impact that veterans have on the population of the state. So Great. it's a unique, unique situation. Thank you. Well, we look forward to you getting back up there, Mr. Secretary, and Dr. Stone, your visit as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Senator Moran had one additional question, so if you don't mind, Mr. Secretary, and I'll have one very short statement after his question. Uh, unfortunately, the chairman almost tells the truth. I have two. One developed while I was waiting to ask the one. We better hurry. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to, to, to go back to the hearing aid specialist just for a moment, uh, and this really is to you, Mr. Secretary. I understood what Dr. Stone said, that the VA m may have reached the conclusion, doesn't believe that additional uh, professionals in this arena is, are, are necessary, but I want to highlight a complaint I've had with the Department of Veterans Affairs for as long as I've, which is now 23 years that I've been on a committee on Veterans Affairs, is can we get the department to abide by the congressional law, the mandate that you have, and the issue of whether or not the uh, specialists are necessary at the VA, that's a different issue than abiding by the law that requires you to determine what the qualifications would be uh, for that profession at the VA. This, I don't want to diminish this issue. It's important to many people, and it's important to many people who are hearing specialists who want to provide those services, who want to serve our veterans. It's important to veterans that they have the care necessary. But I just, knowing you, Mr. Secretary, I want to highlight about the importance of just the folks who work for you not making an independent decision whether or not they get to abide by the law, the mandate that Congress gave them to act in any particular way. Yes, sir. I didn't know that that was occurring. I, that's my honest answer. And you know my background, so they will be told to abide by congressional will. I think it's true when you were confirmed. It's true, as I recall, in every confirmation hearing for a secretary that, that at the VA that my question has been, will you make certain that the people who work for you work with Congress, provide the information that we need, answer our letters, uh, and of course, a given is abide by the law. And so I, I, I just want to highlight for you the importance of that. Uh, we raised the issue of toxic exposure, and I told you about a, a, a study that was completed by the National Academy of Medicine in November 2018. That law that created that study requires you, Mr. Secretary, to determine, based upon that report, uh, within 90 days, 
if there's a trigger in that law. It requires you to make a determination about now how to proceed. Uh, and I just learned that May t March the 22nd, which is just a day ago, you have, you have sent a letter to the committee. You're now, um, you weren't in compliance. I don't know what the 90 days, but you're in, you're in compliance by responding, and I appreciate that. You now have a responsibility that I want to work with you to make certain that there is action taken. And again, we're talking about the generational consequences. The, the National Academy determined there is no medical research that determines the relationship between toxic exposure and the next generation of the, of the veteran. Um, there is a great opportunity and a necessary opportunity for you and the Department of Defense to proceed in determining that relationship, but also getting the facts in place so that we can determine who those veterans are. And you are a perfect person with your relationship and history at the Department of Defense to uh, accomplish this goal. I'll, I'll digest your March 22nd letter in a more timely fashion, but this is uh, something I wanted to highlight for you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. You're welcome. Senator Sullivan was inspired to ask one more question, and I want to grant him that privilege. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll, uh, it, it will just be one. Um, Mr. Secretary, this goes to the issue of infrastructure improvements, streamlining, expansion, where you see the populations that are growing in certain areas of the country and states, populations that are um, declining. And uh, again, in your, I know that broadly the VA has repurposed or disposed of 175 of 430 vacant or mostly vacant buildings since June 2017. I think that makes a lot of sense. But you've also talked to me about, you know, areas if you see, if the VA is looking at expansion with regard to leases or even facilities, um, I know you were struck by some of what was going on in Alaska in that way, given that you, you mentioned not only more vets per capita, the size, but also I think we're one of the few states that does not have a full service VA hospital, not even one. So um, can you just give me an update on what you're, you're thinking with the VA's prioritization of leases that are in the budget requests we have in Fairbanks, we're looking at the possibility of a new campus and also outside of Jay Bear, you may have remember that kind of big uh, parking lot area that we were talking about after our tour? The, the simplest answer is that uh, we are going where the veterans are. Um, and this is only the first step. The legislation uh, requires market assessments to be done throughout the country. Uh, we are in the process of doing that. That develops uh, a, a knowledge base on population trends, the services available in those those areas uh, to inform an asset infrastructure review commission. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I, I expect to come to this committee to ask for an accelerated date of the for the beginning of the deliberations on the asset infrastructure review commission because we have to go where the veterans are. Uh, I also mentioned earlier that that what you said is only the beginning. Uh, of, of uh, many different processes. More than half of our buildings, 57%, are between the age of 50 and 130 years old. Um, because of that, the leasing option um, and co-locating, and I'm not going to say that we, we're, got, we're in the process of doing this, but I saw a number of facilities in Alaska that present us with an opportunity to be more creative about co-locating with entities outside of the federal structure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Let me uh, conclude the meeting by thanking the Secretary and staff and each of the department heads for their being here today and for your thorough answers. I appreciate what y'all are all doing for our vets. We all have the vets at heart as vets in mind and vets in soul, and we're going to see to it they're taken care of as best as possible. I want to thank the VSOs for not being offended by my request for them not to testify, but rather to submit questions and statements. Mr. Fuendes has sat to the back of the room just taking copious notes, and I'm sure he's going to make sure that I, ha I keep every promise I've made, just like they're going to keep every promise that they made. But I want the VSOs to be sure and remember that I've asked you to submit the questions you won't answer. Mr. Secretary, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give you a deadline because I, I that doesn't do any good, I don't think, but I want to give you a, a, the encouragement to as quickly as possible answer those questions and copy the, those of us, the committee staff with the, same, the answers to those questions. Yes, sir. They're very good and they're very, very thoughtful, particularly on the priorities of the budget 
and where, what some of the statements in, in your statements have, have meant, or what actual as they materialize will mean. So it's very important. I, if this works well, I think we'll get better responses because we consume so much time when we have too many witnesses. We don't get to points we really need to get to, as was demonstrated by Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Moran, who's had instant thoughts toward the end. They were both very good and appreciative. But I want to thank you for being here. Uh, thank all our veterans for the service they provide to all of us. Wish all of you a very nice day and a very happy week. And I look forward to seeing you soon and recognize the record will stay open for five days on submissions uh, to the committee for this hearing. And the secretary will respond as quickly as possible to the questions. If you'll get those questions to the committee, right? Yes, sir. They will make sure that it gets to the secretary and that we have a copy to trail it so we can do it. Thank you very much. We Thank you, sir. Thank you.